to you, Phil Murray. Um, he's going to talk to us about the, the global local perspective from local authorities. So, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Good afternoon. Is the mic working? Yes. Good luck. Right, my, the, the title of myself is What Local Authorities Want to Buy, um, which is a fairly wide ranging one, uh, and the answer could be a very short one. Well, probably just about everything we do potentially in the future. Before I get a little bit more into giving a less glib answer uh, to, the, to the question that I've been, been posed, I just want to give you a flavour of uh, the local authority context in terms of public services and where we are. I know you've heard quite a bit this morning about general public policy perspectives from various agencies' points of view, particular emphasis on, on health this morning, but just how it feels for us the world that we're going into. Firstly, and it goes without saying, and I'm uh, speaking to an audience of people who are only too uh, painfully aware of the financial situation, it goes without saying that local authorities are across the country in very, very difficult financial times. This is, depending on who you believe, um, probably the most difficult financial period of local authorities since 1922, and something called the Guinness Acts, which came down uh, on public expenditure after the First World War. So a very, very difficult financial context, and we've been hit first. Um, we have the benefit of a Secretary of State for Communities and Local Governments, I don't tell him I said this, um, but he, he rather volunteered us as a sector to take the first hit in terms of the public expenditure cuts and the comprehensive spending review. Our savings profile has been front-loaded. So we took up front of our 28% reduction over four years, so quickly it's not too bad. We took something like 12 or 13% in year one of the programme. So actually a very, very difficult financial <coughs> environment in which to work. And, and all of you have experienced, I guess, uh, those of you who work with local authorities, some of the impacts of that. We had at the same time lots of messages from central <coughs> government about all the things we had to protect um, whilst making these very uh, severe cuts. One of which, of course, was our investment in um, provision through the voluntary and community sector. But when you added up all the things that we were supposed to protect, it actually kind of got back to where we started from, which is actually quite difficult. And that's been a difficult thing for us. We've had not only central government, but the courts who also seem to be intervening in what we can and can't cut. So actually a very, very constricted financial environment for us, which is not going to get any better. I won't talk any more about money, but we do need to understand that's the context. And that's very different, for instance, the NHS, who have to deliver an efficiency savings programme of 20 billion over a period. But in terms of the actual money they're getting, uh, it stays pretty much, pretty much protected. We've also been on the front line of um, the public service reform agenda, which I know Richard talked about quite a lot this morning, so I don't want to go into uh, in, a, in extensive detail, but the public services reform agenda is kind of at the heart of our future relationship with the sector and local authority, so it is worth talking about a little bit. I don't know whether Richard talked this morning about how the Open Public Services White Paper views public services divided into three. They have a very clear view that public services fall into three categories. Individual services, and that covers about 70% of public expenditure. But any service that is delivered directly to an individual or to a family falls within that. It includes the welfare budget, uh, and that says about 70% of the public purse goes on those services. Then there's community services. Services which are almost by definition parochial. They don't have <coughs> any wider significance beyond the immediate community in which they lie. So you could put in that um, <coughs> range of services things like what we tend to know the government call the street scene. So the immediate environment, what the place looks and feels like. Things like libraries, which ultimately serve a defined community and have no wider significance uh, beyond that. And things like, another example, the youth services, 
which are specific to there for that community and don't necessarily have a broader, broader function. And lastly, the services that they call commissions, um, I think they just want to avoid calling them strategic, which are those services that do require to be managed at a kind of broader geographical level. They might include what we might broadly call kind of in infrastructure services and in infrastructure provision, where it makes no sense to think of them about an individual good uh, or even a smaller community good, but they have wider public benefit. And in terms of thinking about what we're buying and how we deliver our services into the future, that's quite a, a useful model and it might be something that's worth kind of holding in your heads, thinking about your organisations and where you might sit, which of those categories you might see yourself fitting into. There is no re reason for the community sector not to operate in any of those markets, whether they're for individual services, for community services, or indeed to be commissioned to deliver strategic services over a, <coughs> over a broader area. Within that, government is saying, look, taking that model, as you've probably heard, uh, they have a, a determination to open up and to break, effectively, <coughs> the public sector monopoly of delivery of public services, to open up the market and to encourage a much wider range of providers in. That goes right across central government, local government, and all the expressions of government in its various forms, with some exceptions. The police are accepted from all of this, as are the defence and security services, but conceptually, the rest of it is actually in, in the game. Uh, and the government's view is that power and control and decision making within that system should be pushed down to the lowest appropriate level. So that means services which we regard as being centrally, centrally government directed may well pass down to the local level, possibly to local authorities, and services which have traditionally been seen as the local authority province in terms of commissioning and delivery get pushed down into communities to the lowest level at which it makes sense to do them, and some services simply pass into the hands of individuals. Uh, there's no reason for the state uh, to take any view that the resource, the choice and control passes to the, to the individuals. And that really is, is the model with future public services that we are faced with as far as local authorities. And we're, we're in an interesting position of being sort of in the middle uh, of that because we don't live at the national level and we don't live right at the individual or the immediate community level. So we may well find ourselves as being recipients of some things and other things we are we're we're passing through and on to, to others who are in a better position to, to, to either commission or, or deliver. And that's the that's the longer term environment and the future will look very different for us. You know, the traditional local authority structures with which you're probably all, all familiar with, uh, where we have quite um, extensive direct provision. We've got departmentalised commissioning uh, and provision of services which are we're, de we're delivering as an agent of central government. A lot of them. Many of which over the past years have made it difficult for the community and voluntary sector to get into because we effectively are delivering those services on behalf of central government. Central government's got a very clear view about what they want, how those services should be delivered, to what standards, uh, and they hold us to account, or have held us to account for delivering those things at the local level. And you found that immensely frustrating in trying to get into the business because we've said, oh, actually, we've got zero tolerance of failure here. If we can't absolutely guarantee that service is going to be delivered in this particular way and lead to these particular results that will help us meet our targets, then we're not really sure how confident we are in putting that work in, in your direction. And we trust ourselves, because we've got management control, to deliver those things. And that's the transition that we will be going through in local authorities, and we are going through. Not so we're not starting from a, uh, a standing starting this. We're already making the journey in a number of areas, but we've got quite a long way to go 
to the point where I was just talking to, to, to Steve for lunch and, and others and saying for some services, uh, some commissioning activities, we might just be saying, here's a lump of money, this is broadly what we want to come out the other end, come back to us in two or three years' time. Uh, and that's a very kind of different approach to the one that we've been operating over the past few years. And it won't happen overnight. So I think it's important to understand that the government's rhetoric about lots of public service reform and change uh, does have the little caveat, and we don't expect all of this to happen at once, um, in the small print. And there's a, there's a tremendous iconoclastic um, spirit of the times in some government departments. So they, what they want to do first is to break the state monopolies. Um, we've seen this in uh, local government, particularly in the area of education, but the first thing they did pretty much was to get the Academies Act through before the summer break after the June election, which effectively bro broke open the education market in one fell swoop. Um, it still leaves a whole load of questions that um, 15 months later still haven't been answered about how certain ser education services are delivered for instance, when you've got some schools maintained by a local authority, you've got academies, you've got academy chains, you've got free schools, you've got a very, very diverse um, provider market, and yet there are still some kind of basic threshold responsibilities to deliver. And we'll see that in a number of, a number of areas. That we are going through what the head of the policy unit at number 10 described to me the other day as the period of interference. So we, we, we know we're going somewhere, <laughs> we haven't quite identified what it looks like, but our worry is everybody's focused on all the hassle of getting there. <laughs> so, um, um, and that's why it all feels a bit sort of ill-tempered and uh, difficult. And of course that's the reality, because we're faced with it on the ground and having to look people in, in the eyeball. But we are in that, we are in that very, very difficult period of an iconoclastic government, broken the mould, has got lots of passion about what it wants to see, which includes a very vibrant and diverse voluntary and community sector at the forefront of delivering public services, but actually it doesn't really know how to get there. And um, we will see this all the time because we'll trip over the detail where things get wrong, we'll get worried about that, but we've got to keep our eye on the, on the prize and we don't come out think about some aspects of the government's agenda. I think many, many parts of this agenda are absolutely right and are pointing in the right direction. I'm thinking about tackling social disadvantage. And if you, if you were to ask me, it's a personal question, what's the, what's the big thing as a local authority I want to buy in the future? It will be that very thing. It will be unleashing uh, the innovation, the power, the the uh, lack of authority uh, and in terms of authority figures, the potential within the social and voluntary sector to tackle social disadvantage. I mean, that is, to, to me, the, the critical thing. That, that's going to be opened up in a, in a huge <coughs> way. Um, and I'll give you an example of how I see that sort of thing working potentially for us in a very specific example. Um, and that's around problem in complex families. Um, some of you may have heard that the government has launched uh, a what will be a universal strategy for tackling intergenerational disadvantage and long-term problem families. These are the families that actually, if you add them all up, cost the state the, you know, the, uh, a hugely disproportionate amount of public expenditure. Um, and government wants to tackle this in a different way. They are giving local authorities the lead in aligning all the public sector budgets in an area in order to tackle the problems of the most complex families within those communities. This is under the title of community budgets. It received a huge impetus after the riots in August this policy, and you may have heard David Cameron say, I want to put a rocket booster under the you know, agency solving the problems of these, these families. And, and that, um, I think well, this will be a, a litmus test 
it seems to me, at a relatively early stage of whether the public policy direction talked about by government is an effective one, whether we can make it work. The idea is that all the, all the budgets are aligned um, as far as we can, and we use the money differently. So rather than health, education, social care, um, DWP, criminal justice, the police, uh, all putting in resource into families in a disconnected way, we have a sort of single commissioning approach to the family. And my test of how this is going to work, and whether we manage the transition of the public sector, is if we actually engage effectively with the voluntary community sector in, for them to largely deliver that programme. Nationally, we're talking about 130 thousand families just in our county in Devon we're talking about 100 about 1300 so quite a significant uh, these families can cost up to three quarters of a million pounds a year in terms of public service interventions and I'm sure there are families that that actually that actually cost more the trick for us will be to to think about how we can pull those resources and commission services from people who are best placed to work with those families, to deliver for us, <coughs> to reduce call on the public purse, and more secure outcomes for those families than they're getting at the moment. And that's very much something that we're going to be in the market buying. What we're going to be buying is social outcomes. Um, it's going to be a very different model, and I, I, I think it will work. It's going to take time. It's going to take an act of various leaps of faith um, from us, and it's going to require different ways of working. And a challenge again, I'm sure this has been thrown down already to the to the sector, is how the sector can join together, articulate, uh, work as part of larger consortia groups, organisations, in order to get the economies of scale and a kind of strategic reach, but at the same time maintain that very local and distinctive approach. And that's going to be, that's going to be the, the challenge for us. Can we get in new mechanisms? I know I think this has already been referred to in one of the workshops. We are looking across the peninsula at local development of social investment bonds. So we, as the public agencies, can provide upfront finance uh, in the way that's been done in already in some places, as with the, the Peterborough Reoffender <coughs> Management Program. We can actually get some upfront finance for social enterprises, uh, voluntary and community sector organisations to undertake work on our behalf and effectively share the savings. And that's what we want to do. If we've got a problem, we want to achieve a social outcome, that problem will be costing us. If we can find a better way of doing that, working with largely the voluntary and community sector, we're going to be best placed to work with, with families, um, we can share the dividend. That's a, such a different model to the one that we've operated in the past, isn't it? Because it's been in the past, central government money tips a whole load of uh, money into the sausage machine, uh, into local agencies. Some of it comes out to um, voluntary community sector in a very restricted form with all, all sorts of restrictions and constraints around it. And you have to um, work quite hard to get access to that funding by putting quite a bit of your resource into preparing yourselves to be ready to do it. Now I think you're going to be looking at doing things in a very different way, which will be based on trust uh, and an investment return on savings. Um, it's quite easy and glib to say, and that is the other side of the interference in terms of where we, where we want to get to. Um, but that, the, that sort of complex families uh, issue, I think, will be a touchstone. I think there is huge uh, potential right across everything we do. I, mean, I think other than the kind of hard civil engineering stuff, which I guess you probably wouldn't say, maybe there are some um, yeah, potential uh, social, uh, community and voluntary groups who want to get involved in <laughs> designing uh, bypasses and so on. But, but other than that kind of hard infrastructure stuff, 
there isn't really a lot we do, especially in terms of our work with people and communities that we couldn't buy, actually. So there's a challenge that I throw back. You know, you, you know what the market is. The presumption that government has is that the local uh, authority or central government doesn't deliver the service anymore. We are the open public services um, reform when it becomes inactive would effectively require us to justify anything that we decide we want to continue to deliver directly. <coughs> so the default position would, would be that we just don't do it. You know, we commission it, we work with others to commission it. So actually in terms of the sector, getting together and identifying a strategic opportunity <coughs> and actually coming up with offers to local authorities and public sectors in terms of what you could do um, rather than just waiting for us to let contracts is something I think you should be doing. And again, that's something that's best done collectively when you're looking at those opportunities rather than organisations trying to do it individually. And that again, is quite, that's quite a culture change, isn't it? Because you'll be sort of scouring opportunities in terms of what local authorities are potentially putting out at the moment rather than going and making an offer. Um, and those offers are available. The localism bill effectively enables communities to challenge public service deliveries and say we could do better. Here's our challenge, here's our offer, we'll do it, we'll do it for you. And again, we have to learn how to respond to that, but the sector has to be also potentially potentially on the front foot. And as I said, that we mustn't restrict ourselves in our thinking. We, we are, as local authorities, very rapidly moving away from some of our traditional structural forms. I mean, the, in, in my authority's case, we've got rid of the traditional directorates. <coughs> local authorities are kind of federal organisations where directorates have their own quite strong cultures, they have strong <coughs> direct professional purpose. And we're saying, no, actually, as organisations, we need to build ourselves around the needs of individuals, families and communities, which means abandoning some of the professional boundaries within our structures, just to look at the problem. You know, we haven't got central government saying, you've got to do it like this anymore. What we've got to do is to do an analysis where we, lo we locally are able to identify what the problem is and commission the services to meet those problems, rather than say, we're doing X in education, X in social care, Y in public health, which we'll be, we'll, we'll be getting. And again, that's, a, that's something I think the, the sector will see, a change in, in local authorities, that we are organizing, organizing ourselves so we're more coherent. I'm sure you have experienced in local authorities varying approaches to the commissioning of services for you, depending on which department might be originating the, the, the commissioning. We're all rapidly trying to move away from that. Um, in terms of my, in my council, we're, we're bringing together our adults and children's commissioning into a single team so that we get much more of a, an organised and coherent approach because we have very different approaches to children's and adults commissioning. Good features in both but also things that, that can be improved. We are, so we, are, we are not looking down our traditional silos anymore. We're, we're thinking much more geographically and holistically about communities. And again, in terms of the <coughs> sector responding to that, you might like to think uh, about whether groups within a geographical area are providing a potential coherent offer in terms of what the local authority might commission. You've all got your own private and public passions about the particular things you're doing, but perhaps if there is at the local level uh, some kind of mechanism of bringing that together collectively makes us makes it the job easier for us as local authorities in terms of actually commissioning a service where we might be looking at a broader community, community benefit. So, a very changing, challenging, changing, quite exciting landscape, all against the backdrop of the most difficult <laughs> public financial um, backdrop, uh, and that's, that's 
that's very, very tough. I think it's a pity, actually, that some of these reforms are happening at a time when we're all having to focus so much on the bottom line. That is a real shame, because I think a lot of the ideas are very good. Um, the question always comes back to, to where's the money? But there are real opportunities, and particularly for you, because you can do things cheaper than we can. And that's the, often because you are not constrained in the way that we are. You are by your nature a more flexible sector. Uh, you, you operate in response to need. So you're probably ahead of us in terms of your intelligence, your antennae, and the way that, the way that you work. I just want to, having said all of that, I don't want to give you the impression that, in my view, the sector is the chief answer to delivering public services, and that's the reason actually this is all about cost cutting, and we just shunt a cost problem. Because that's not how I see it. I genuinely believe that there are more cost effective ways of doing it. Um, and it, of course, is changing. And the it being a much more uh, flexible and locally determined thing is much better than if a civil servant in Whitehall is telling us that they expect us to achieve X, Y, and Z target in communities. But going back to that original question, what do local authorities want to buy? Um, part of it is well, just about everything you can imagine in terms of our portfolio potentially. You might even want to suggest to us something that you want to buy. Um, from you, which actually helped me tell objectives that we can sort of full of. So, uh, again, another challenge for you to think creatively about the, the public policy landscape. Um, as I said, I think it's, a, it's an exciting time. I think there's a, um, a growing maturity in relationships across the system, as I perceive it, which is being sorely tested by some of the short-term problems that we've got. I do think we need to hold to, together and not get too distracted. Right? Because it's great. I can say it from you know, generally from our politicians' side and officer, there's a very great deal of commitment to try to make this work and to do things differently. We're not trying to hold on to our old empires, because actually that's not something that's that's necessarily sustainable anymore. But I think I'll stop there. Um, because otherwise I'll, I'll talk all afternoon. It's a fascinating subject about potential. And just give you, if there's any time, an opportunity to ask any questions about that. Okay. Can we just take uh, two questions, I think, because we might also have to do it by the first two people to put their hands up. So that's the person right at the back of the room, and then this person here. So I'll just get the microphone. <laughs> Um, my name is Rebecca Hardwick and I'm the Chair of East Seven Volunteer Support Agency. Um, I just wanted to say it's really hard to what you were talking about in terms of um, offering contracts based on social outcomes. And I have um, a bit of a cheeky request that that uh, desire is made known to your procurement teams. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, that's often the point at which the Commissioner's best intention can't be realised because the procurement team don't have the flexibility to do that. I think we, 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 we know, we will all, anyone who's been involved in will know that procurement is an incredibly difficult area. Um, partly because at the end of the day it is public money um, and we have to uh, be very careful about how we procure using that public money. Partly, as I said, because of the, the sort of zero tolerance of failure, fear, um, don't embrace it, the things that we've had to do in the past. And, and uh, this is where my plea for a little bit of time, I think, is, 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 is relevant. Because a lot of officers have got their real fear of what happens if something just goes completely pear-shaped in contract. <laughs> and it's because somebody can go back and say, yeah, but your procurement was all over the place, and it was far too weird. Really what we needed to be was much more rigorous. But I do take the point, we are, We've got to explore procurement in a different way. It's, I suppose it's part of the national public procurement issue here that we, we really have followed the EU rules and every other rule to the nth degree. <laughs> um, and possibly we just need to rethink the way that we do it. Yes, I, I take your point. I'd, I mean, I'd suggest actually the sector can really help in terms of improving that 
Yeah. I think at the moment you'll see the momentum of previous exercise is expressing itself in procurement. I would hope within a relatively short period you'll start to see a very different style. I would, I would hope, particularly around the sort of complex and problem family area. Oh, hi, I'm Nora Woodbury, and I'm the Mother of Senior Citizens Advice. Um, there's so much opportunity here. There is, a, a, you know, recognising that we're in a difficult environment, but there's a lot of um, really good opportunity. And my question really is, it's really kind of communications um, question, because previously, when we have had very kind of rigid central government targets, directives, local area agreements, etc., etc., it's been um, a tool that the voluntary and community sector can use to say, ah, oh, what, what, what are our local authorities' current key strategic objectives, and how is the work that we're doing feeding into that? So the question is, kind of, I'm not entirely sure at the moment what's replacing that vehicle, so that when we are examining ourselves and asking what you are in doing, what you're asking us to do, and being on the, on the front foot, how do we then really have a clear idea of what our local authorities' strategic objectives are in our fields? Well, I'll answer that. It's, um being too clear, actually, it's going, it is going to be quite difficult in terms of um, providing a wholly coherent picture because to some extent, by the nature of this agenda, it's quite sort of all over the place uh, and opportunistic. And that's what the government wants to create, you know, the, the end of the top-down management program. That's what they say at the moment, of course. We're, we're, we're the two years down the track when uh, letting a thousand flowers bloom and seeing 150 flowers die and ministers call to account for, for uh, that, that's an impact on biodiversity as a result. Um, I, don't, I don't know, but at the moment it is a bit more freeful. My, my sense is that, and I don't want to reopen the Health and Wellbeing Board debate, uh, I am very mindful of what has been said this morning, I take that on board and we'll be uh, discussing that when I get back to the ranch to make sure that our approach is going to be appropriate. Um, the Health and Wellbeing Board, it seems to me, for a lot of the work of the sector should provide the kind of overarching um, priorities because in, in a sense that's what we're and I think health and wellbeing boards will take on quite a quite a major role in relation to that. Whether the strategic I don't think the strategic partnerships as they are currently constituted in some places they've gone anyway will be a sufficiently strong mechanism. But, but I suppose with all the health and wellbeing boards and your joint strategic needs assessment processes <laughs> um, the change they have to be because they've got to be broadened in turn. You will see an identification of priorities both at whole authority level, but I think more particularly at community level. Because you know, you know, I, I have a view that as public agencies, communities should be judging us not on the sort of individual professional bits, but actually how are we making life better? You know, we, these are the priorities, these are the things we said we'd make better in Clubton or um, South Gloucestershire or wherever. And how are you actually, how are you actually doing that? Are you improving those outcomes? Um, so I think that that's the mechanism that I do to provide some coherence. Um, but I think there will be a slight danger because of the, 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 the previous government just had such a strong command and control planning mentality. And this one's got something that is, couldn't be more opposite. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> it's going to be quite difficult for us to do, but I think we can reconcile.